We are talking today with Mark Shapiro. Mark Shapiro has been an investigative journalist for more than 20 years. He is the editorial director of the Center for Investigative Reporting in San Francisco. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including Harper's, The Nation, Mother Jones, The Atlantic Monthly, and The New York Times Magazine. He has also been a correspondent on Now with Bill Moyers, PBS's Frontline World, and NPR's Marketplace. And he is here to talk about his new book, Exposed, The Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power. So tell us, what was the motivation in writing your book, Exposed? Uh, my motivation was this. I've done, I've done a lot of, uh, most of my career has actually been doing international reporting. So I've... Uh, both in Europe and a lot in Latin America and, and, very, and elsewhere. And I kind of was watching the, uh, the, the, the changing uh, power dynamic uh, in the world as I would do my reporting, whether it was on money laundering, financial crime, and uh, uh, environmental uh, reporting. And uh, about 25 years ago, when I was a young uh, reporter, a bit younger than I am now, um, I co-authored a book. It was called Circle of Poison, and it was an expose of essentially how the uh, chemicals that were banned in the United States back in those days, we're talking way back in the 80s, were uh, then subsequently exported to developing countries. And at that time, that was kind of a moral issue, like how if we ban something because it's too dangerous for Americans, how do we then turn around and export it to you know, Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, Malaysia, developing countries? And it got a bit of attention back then. So, 30 years goes by, I do a number of other things, including getting away from chemicals, because it's very complicated, as people know, it's a complicated matter. And then I start watching, uh, uh, over the last couple of years, the shifting uh, role of the United States in the world, the, the retreat of this current administration from environmental protection, and essentially how the rest of the world is beginning to move forward while we have been moving backwards. And what I noticed was the... Um, was this phenomenon that basically, while America was stepping away from environmental protection, particularly around chemicals and things like that, as well as climate change and et cetera, the rest of the world was moving ahead. And suddenly I saw that basically the United States was becoming the new dumping ground for products that had been banned elsewhere. And that, that uh, effort was led by the European Union. So I began watching this shifting power dynamic between the European Union and the United States. And one, the basic growing influence of the European Union, because it's grown in population and in wealth and is now, of course, the world's largest market, the world's largest single economy. And, and I wanted to ask the question, which I do in this book, is uh, what happens when a new government starts rewriting the rules of global production? And that's, that's largely what this book is about, because uh, it's been the United States that's written those rules for many, many years. And now it's the European Union, which has a very, very different ideas as to environmental protection. And I look into those, uh, the implications for the United States of those ideas. So can you give us a brief history of the situation here in the U.S., how we came to be where we are today? Didn't, in 76, didn't the Congress pass the Toxic Substance Control Act? Uh, yeah, yeah, back in the 70s. I mean, that's it was interesting. Back in the 70s, the U.S. was really uh, the undisputed leader of the so-called free world at that time. There's no competing economic power to the United States, certainly. So we were the first to pass, uh, we were the first to create an EPA. We were the first to create a law governing toxic substances, and the rest of the world followed us. So uh, the Toxic Substance Control Act the world's, really, the world's first law to control, uh, to attempt to control toxic chemicals was passed in 76, really took effect, in essence, in, uh, in 1981. And, uh, and that law uh, basically began the process of saying, wait a minute, let's, let's look at some of the toxic uh, components of uh, some of the chemicals that are out there, the profusion of chemicals that entered into the market after World War II. But huge loophole put in that law enormous loophole that you could drive a thousand tanker trucks to every day. And uh, that law basically grandfathered onto the market uh, all the chemicals that were already on the market as of 1981 and said, okay, anything on the market pre-1981, no toxicity testing, no assessment as to its danger to human health or the environment. And so what's happened today, 30 years later, 30 or 27 years later, uh, uh, 27 years later, 
uh, uh, 90% of the chemicals on the market today in the United States of America predate 1981, which means 65,000 chemicals have never, ever been assessed for their toxicity or their effect on the environment or human health. And that is a enormous loophole and, and, and correlates essentially to a time when we are coming to understand, scientists are coming to understand more and more the effects that chemicals have on the human, uh, on the human uh, metabolism as well as on the environment. So our law has clearly not kept pace with scientific knowledge on these kind of questions. And one of the things I look at in the book is really the effect that it has in terms of the uh, amount of toxic chemicals that we encounter every day here in the United States, as well as how other uh, parts of the world are beginning to address this enormous loophole in American law. So we've been effectively testing that other 10 percent to the actually do any testing on that? Uh, well, let's clarify the point here. Number one, uh, there have been some, some basic tests done on the other 10 percent, and they have to go through some sort of uh, uh, minimal testing to, to get registration. Although even our own, uh, the EPA's own internal audits have, have criticized the inadequacy of those testing for the 10 percent that are tested. And number two, key to think about, uh, the 90 percent of the chemicals that have not been tested, in fact, that may be a wrong way to formulate it because they are being tested. But they're being tested on us. They're being tested on you. They're being tested on me. They're being tested on everybody out there. Uh, and we are the guinea pigs in this grand experiment, except there is no control. I mean, that's what scientists do, right? They, they create a control. So they create the, this, 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 this animal over here is exposed to uh, X. And this animal over here is exposed to nothing, and we find out what the, uh, what the exposure to X is. Well, now we, as Americans, are actually, all of us are in the X file, basically, it, it being exposed to everything all at the same time. And now we're beginning to see what the effects of that exposure are. So we are actually being, te uh, tests are going on. They're going on in real time, and they're going on now, and they're going on on us. And... Uh, one of the striking things you see when you do the reporting and you look at the scientific literature are the epidemiological uh, surveys that are uh, 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 the evidence is mounting through the epidemiological surveys, which are showing kind of rising ca cases of, uh, of, of cancer, uh, unexpected spikes in uh, breast cancer, uh, rising cases of uh, endocrine troubles, sexual malfunction, declining uh, sperm rates, higher rates of, uh, of uh, infertility among uh, young women. These are all happening now. This is uh, the very top research institutions in America, Europe, and elsewhere in the world are showing these uh, public health conditions. And at the same time, what's happening is uh, scientists in this country and, uh, and in Europe and elsewhere in the world are beginning to identify the particular characteristics of particular chemicals that could be contributing to those conditions, right? Chemicals that actually could be contributing to cancer or could be contributing to endocrine uh, uh, troubles down the line as they accumulate over the years. And, uh, and so what I write about in the book is really what the very, very different responses have been uh, to that evidence. The evidence is there. The evidence is clear. And uh, the responses by the United States, as opposed to the European Union, the other major economic uh, power in the world today, have been extremely different. And that's essentially what I look at in the book, is, is, is the, the difference in those responses and why. Talk about those responses to, and talk about how the European Union came to where they are now. Uh, well, the European uh, Union began looking at these rising cases of, of of disease that could be caused by environmental contributing factors such as chemicals. And they began looking at those, and they also began looking at the, at the uh, one, the, the health impacts of those uh, developments, and two, the enormous costs, uh, uh, the financial costs, the financial burden that that was placing on society. Why? Because in, in, in Europe, uh, the government, for the most part, pays for health care. So the government is paying for health care. They're the ones who bear the financial burden for health problems that come on down the line. It's actually, a, in many ways, what what's, what's been happening in Europe is actually 
financially driven as much as it is uh, a health driven and concern for people's health. So by looking at the billions of dollars in health costs mixed with the actual health uh, implications, the Europeans said, well, wait a minute, a lot of the chemicals that we're seeing uh, uh, contributors to, to cancer or endocrine problems or reproductive uh, problems are in uh, all the products all around us. They're in, uh, they're in cosmetics, they're in toys, they're in electronics, they're in automobiles, a whole litany of things that we uh, engage with on an everyday basis and began systematically to, uh, to one, demand the removal of those uh, chemicals and two, to uh, compel manufacturers to actually submit all that 90% of chem all those 65,000 chemicals uh, that have never undergone testing are now going to be forced to undergo testing in the European Union before they can be registered for continued use uh, in Europe. So, so, so what's what's been happening is a very systematic look at the health effects of chemicals in uh, the European Union, and uh, which is leading to dramatic changes in uh, the cosmetics industry, in the electronics industry, in the toys industry, that I think is beginning to present a direct challenge to essentially how we approach those hazards here in the United States. So their response as they gather more data on this is to phase out or eliminate those chemicals in products? Yes. Let me give you an example. The European Union's uh, health directorate began looking at the uh, ingredients in cosmetics. And what they did is they identified a whole groups of chemicals that are actually uh, carcinogenic, mutagenic, and toxic to the reproductive system. They call them CMRs. And, and by looking at those CMRs, they said, wait a minute, you know, what, what, are C, what are CMRs, what are carcinogens and mutagens doing in cosmetics and mascara and skin cream and nail polish and the lipstick and all that fun stuff? And so in 2005, the uh, European Union banned all CMRs from use in cosmetics for sale in Europe. Now, who even knew that such uh, ingredients existed here in the United States? Nobody's told us, so certainly the U.S. government hasn't told us anything because the FDA has no responsibility to oversee the safety of cosmetic, of ingredients in cosmetics. Now we know. The reason we know is because the Europeans have published a list they call it the negative list, and on that negative list are all the substances that are either carcinogenic, mutagenic, or reproductively toxic that are no longer permitted to be used in cosmetics in the United States. Now, by comparison, the United States uh, FDA, which nominally has responsibility for uh, uh, cosmetics uh, in the United States, has no power to assess the toxicity of ingredients in cosmetics. So you have a situation where the world's leading market, leading uh, economic uh, force, uh, has basically banned these substances from cosmetics. And you have American firms, which of course operate very deeply in, uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, now faced with this challenge of what do we do now? Because we've been operating according to American rules for many, many years. Now the Europeans are demanding we take these ingredients out. And what I, uh, part of what I look at in the book is really what the reaction of some of the big American cosmetic companies have been to this sudden uh, emergence of far tighter environmental health standards uh, in Europe than they've been accustomed to back here in the United States. So in the EU, did they actually test these individual products and say these products have this whatever in them and you can't bring them in? Or did they just like do a list of these are all nasty, pro these are all nasty toxins that we do not want in these types of products anymore? Uh, what they did is actually, um, rather than go out and test each individual uh, product, what the European Union is set up a committee of toxicologists who meet uh, four times a year in Brussels. They gather from universities across Europe, and they assess the scientific literature. They assess the existing body of scientific literature as to the toxicity of these ingredients. And things that are determined to, to be either you know, carcinogenic, mutagenic, reprotoxins, uh, they demand be removed from, uh, from, from cosmetics. So they do not do testing on their own. But what's interesting about that is the literature is available. Literature is out there. There's plenty of studies out there that talk about the potential toxic uh, qualities of various ingredients in, 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 in cosmetics. And, uh, and, but the key difference is that the Europeans are actually looking at that data and deciding, well, let's act. The Americans have access to the same data, the same data 
same research institutions. This is a big global, you know, here in Seattle, this is a very sophisticated research institution itself. We have enormously uh, sophisticated research enterprises here in a whole array of areas, as we have all across the country. And there are very top universities here, very top scientists. Um, and those scientists contribute to this body of knowledge around, uh, around chemical uh, toxicity. That knowledge is published in scientific journals for anybody to look at, including you or me, which is what I did for the book. And there are many citations of these journals uh, in the book. And, uh, and, and, and are part of the sort of accumulating body of evidence around these issues. So the same body of evidence looked at by uh, European uh, officials and American officials, very, very different response. The response here in the United States has been essentially non-existent to the data that's been accumulating uh, over and over again. So one of the great ironies, of course, is that many of the Europeans' actions are based partly on the research of American scientists. So what has then been the reaction of U.S. corporations to what the European Union has been doing? Well, I'll tell you, the reaction has been uh, very interesting. Um, many of the very same companies that in uh, Europe are, uh, are indicating their clear willingness to abide by the European laws. Why? Because they want to hold on to the European market. We're talking about a, a market of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And um, so I came upon many companies, both in the cosmetic realm and in the toy realm and in the electronics realm, essentially that were agreeing uh, to accommodate to the Europeans' new requirements to remove these chemicals, and at the same time coming back here to America and saying, this is impossible. How can you, how can you demand this? I saw this in the, in the cosmetics industry. I, I, I was uh, interviewing some very top uh, officials in, in, in one of the largest American uh, uh, personal care products companies. Uh, and asked them about the Europeans' laws. I said, what are you going to do with all these new uh, requirements to take these substances out of your products? And he said, uh, he said, well, you know, no problem. We hired a couple of toxicologists. We hired a couple of new scientists. We're going to assess what we have in there that shouldn't be. We're going to take it out and find something else. And uh, like two months later, I went back to California, where I live, and uh, watched a debate unfold in Sacramento in the state capitol. That debate was very interesting because a group of legislators and environmental health uh, scientists uh, had, had introduced a bill uh, that would require uh, cosmetic companies to submit to the state any, uh, uh, the ingredient list with any, anything that was a carcinogen, a mutagen, or a reproductive toxin. The state health department would have to be informed, not, not removed from the, uh, from the, from the product, but, but would have to be informed. And who was the main lobbyist against that, uh, that, uh, that proposal was the very same company who just told me in Europe that they, could, uh, that they were taking all this stuff out. And here in the United States, they were claiming that uh, this would cause job loss and this would cause economic disruption and there would be competitive uh, disadvantage to the United States. A whole litany of arguments that we've heard over and over and over and over again. And uh, in this very example, you saw an emergence of this double standard that is, that is really emerging quite vividly between what American companies say they can do in Europe because they essentially have to do it and what they say is impossible to do uh, here in the United States. And did you see repeated examples of this? Yeah, I saw repeated examples. Let me give you another example. Toys have been in the news a lot lately. So toys have been in the news. We all know now about these sort of poison toys coming in with lead from China. Uh, uh, but there's another example here, I think. Lead is, uh, 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 lead is, of course, technically illegal in the United States. It's just been the complete evisceration of the regulatory authorities uh, that enabled this stuff to slip through. But let's talk about legal toxins. So um, uh, when it comes to toys, uh, we now know that the Chinese produce 80 percent of the world's toys. Among the ingredients in many toys in the United States are things called phthalates. Phthalates are kind of a, a plastic additive that makes plastic very soft and gooey and kind of uh, fun to play with. And it's kind of like the little rubber duckies you might uh, remember uh, in your childhood or maybe, maybe, maybe you play with one today. I don't know. Um, and, um, and all the fun little giraffes and fun little toy animals that are very soft. Uh, book covers and, uh, are often used phthalates as well. Well, the, um, the, 
the, uh, the, the evidence that's been rising around the effects of phthalates on the developing male uh, endocrine system are quite powerful. And actually what they're suggesting is that phthalates, by exposure in the womb and exposure in the first year of life, can actually decrease the production of testosterone, which is the male sexual hormone and not really something you want to play around with too much in the first couple of years of life. So uh, the evidence is, is growing around this uh, question. And so for the past uh, seven years, uh, phthalates have been banned for all uses in toys in the European Union. Can't use phthalates. All those fun little animals and stuff like that, no phthalates uh, permitted to be used in the European Union basically because of this rising concern uh, of their effect on the developing males uh, sexual development in a very sensitive period of life. Uh, in the United States we have no such provisions whatsoever. Uh, uh, with one exception, which is the state of California where I live, finally did pass a phthalate ban mimicking that of the European Union, uh, which takes effect in 2009, uh, which is essentially 10 years after the EU's ban went into effect. But here's the main point of all this, is that for 10 years, uh, Europe's manufacturers have been prompted to develop alternatives to phthalates, far less toxic alternatives to phthalates. And there are major, major uh, multinational chemical companies in Europe that have in fact developed alternatives that have been determined safe by European as well as American uh, regulators. And uh, so now we're in a situation like this, which is all those manufacturers we all know about in China, right? We all know now that 80% of, of the toys are made in China. Well, in those big industrial zones where they make the toys, they make toys without phthalates for the European Union, and they make toys with phthalates for the United States. And that is literally happening as we speak right now. And, uh, and I think this is a particularly uh, 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 vivid example of how the United States is rapidly kind of becoming a dumping ground for products that are banned elsewhere because even countries like Korea and Taiwan and other emerging economies are beginning to act on the phthalate question. And, uh, and the, 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 the interesting question is, all right, so what effect does this have? Does this send, like, European kids back to the Stone Age so they're sitting in caves, you know, playing with, like, little Pinocchio models made out of wood? And uh, the answer is no. If you go to any uh, playroom or if your friends in Europe who have kids or whatever, you'll see the same kind of fun little animals, the same goofy little uh, doodads uh, made out of plastic, made out of some form of pliable material. Uh, uh, that, are, that, that are equally fun and nutty and, and nonsensical as those here in the United States. It's just that they basically do not have phthalates, which are determined to be a risk by European authorities, and we have the phthalates here in the United States. So I think, one, the notion that alternatives are there is critical, and they are there. And uh, two, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to industry people, uh, I talked in every case, and all these industries we're talking about, I spent a lot of time talking to representatives in those industries, uh, including in the toy industry, who, who claim, which claimed, of course, that, uh, that basically phthalates, uh, if, you, if, you, if you ban phthalates in America, it'll cause job loss, and it'll cause lack of competitive position in the United States in the toy industry. And plus, they're not really dangerous anyway, is the essential argument of the toy industry. Um, so I was curious as to the um, actual economic effects of this ban, as, as I was in all the other instances I'm talking about. So I went around, I talked to all these investment analysts, both in Europe and the United States, people who, who have uh, uh, extraordinary focus on the toy industry and investment houses on, on both sides of the uh, Atlantic, and not one of them could tell me that the phthalate ban uh, had even a negligible impact on the toy industry. Uh, 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 toy industry financial prospects, and in fact, the European toy industry has been growing at several percentage a year. So the um, the question here is: Are these changes economically feasible? When the Europeans took the chemicals out of cosmetics, what happened to the cosmetics industry? When they took them out of electronics, what happened to the electronics industry? When they took them out of toys, what happened to the toy industry? One after another, I looked into what the economic impact has been. 
And in fact, the econ there, there has not been the sort of economic catastrophe that had long been predicted by both European and American industry when these measures went into effect. Here in the United States, we've been engaged in these battles over and over and over again for 20 uh, some years now, uh, where environmentalists uh, say, uh, take this stuff out, it's dangerous, you're harming my children. And uh, industry says, you know, you're a utopian, get off your high horse, uh, you're going to cost American jobs, you're going to cost American competitiveness, and, uh, and it's, plus it's not dangerous anyway. And this battle has gone on over and over and over, and it's one of the reasons that I got into writing this book, was because I was tired of that repetitive quality of that dynamic. It becomes like kabuki theater after a while. Everybody has their position, they stake out their position, and the same arguments fly back and forth. So I wanted to find an example where that sort of standoff was broken. And in fact, that is what's happened, where, where the approach that the Europeans are taking uh, has actually begun to break that standoff, at least according to the biggest single market in the world, which is roughly comparable to our own. And so that standoff is now being shaken apart. And, the, uh, and so the, the, the notion of what's possible and what's impossible, I think, is shifting dramatically because basically the, basically the, shake, the shakedown of, of this kabuki theater, which, which I think is it, it challenges basic uh, American uh, uh, um, claims of what is infeasible and what's feasible. And I think that is what's key in this, in this matter because uh, it got me back into writing this book. Because I'd given, I'd, uh, everybody out there who's spent any time on chemicals knows that it gets very complicated with lethal dose levels and complicated chemical formulas. It's extremely complicated. And I sort of started my career on chemicals, and I kind of left it for a while, and I did many other things as a journalist. But I got back into it and wrote this book because I felt that there was a uh, very important change that was happening. And this change was basically uh, uh, challenging uh, American uh, claims of what's possible, what's not possible. The economic argument, I looked at the economic argument, that fell apart. I looked at the alternatives argument, there's no alternatives, that fell apart. One after another, these arguments that we've heard here in the United States, they don't hold up once you begin looking at them. And that was what was, uh, what was interesting to me in, in, in doing this book. So I see it in many ways as, a, as, a, as, a, as an investigation into what American companies do when the rules of production in the economy change, because that's essentially what we're talking about, is who writes the rules in the global economy, and who writes them in particular in this case when it pertains to, 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 to health and protection of people from environmental hazards. That's what this book looks at, that particular aspect of this question. And uh, one after another after another, the bluff that I think has been sort of reigning here in the United States for now several decades is being called. And that to me is an interesting uh, area to investigate. So now that these U.S. corporations have been proven to still be viable while making these changes, what's your sense for why they are still resisting implementing these changes here in the U.S.? Well, I think there's um, an enormous amount of, of, of vested interest in the way things are done here. I think it's a, it's a question of like the familiar production practices. You, you know how it's going. And, uh, and, and so there's enormous vested interest in the status quo, number one. Number two, uh, Accepting that you change the way you're doing things here, there's a challenge for an American company that's been doing things in another way and suddenly is going to start changing their production lines. What are they going to say to you, a member of the public? They're going to say, now, not only zestier, but safer. Now, uh, a less toxic uh, version of your shampoo. Not, there's, there's no way to market this without, 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 without being in a, put in a very uncomfortable uh, position, both in a marketing point of view and also in a legal point of view. So I think that's, that adds an extra element of complication to, uh, to the vested interest in the status quo here. And I think there are, um, what, what is actually 
beginning to happen is some of the big American multinationals, for example, the big, uh, big personal care products company, produced a lot of cosmetics and everything, the one I was referring to earlier. That company um, told me very, very soon, uh, sorry, uh, that company, I'd been talking to officials with that company for some time over the course of my reporting. And, and shortly before I finished uh, the book, I had a, f a final conversation with an official who told me that, indeed, uh, the company had decided to accommodate to the European Union's uh, uh, demands on removal of toxic chemicals for all their products. No more dual production, one U.S., one Europe, but actually everything according to the European Union standards. Big American company, multi-billion dollar a year company. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and uh, and I asked him where I hadn't seen this anywhere. Where where was it? Well, it was it was tucked away in a in a in a, in a, in a corner of the company's British website. Uh, and I have my I have the address of the site in my book. Uh, that was very interesting because because number one, what does it tell you? It tells you that number one, we Americans in that case are the sort of accidental beneficiaries of a law passed in, uh, in, in a jurisdiction over which we have very little, if no, actual influence. This is uh, coming out of Brussels, out of the European Union. And two, what does it say about America's regulatory structures? What does it say about the FDA? Suddenly, in a major American company is abiding by the rules of the European Union, the FDA becomes totally irrelevant. And that is essentially what's happening. So when I my book is also called, uh, it's called, um, the subhead is, of course, what's at stake for American power? Toxic chemistry of everyday products, and what's at stake for American power? And what's at stake for American power is a dwindling influence over key matters of environmental protection. Why? Because we've been retreating from environmental protection for years now, uh, while the rest of the world is moving ahead. So what's at stake for American power is both our diplomatic sway over other countries, and which we've long held. And let's face it, the United States has long been a leader in environmental protection. Whether you liked or not what the United States was doing, we were at the forefront of it. And I was one of those criticizing, saying we were not doing enough. But in any case, we were at the head of the, uh, we were leading. Now that's completely flipped. And so the uh, one, the, the, the rule writing of the num numerous emerging economies, uh, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Brazil, other, other um, countries, beginning to reshape their laws according to those of the European Union, not according to those of the United States. That is one of has a considerable diplomatic uh, implication. It also has economic implications. As these uh, emerging economies begin to evolve into, into the global economy, become much more strong uh, players in the global economy, their rules are going to be written more along the lines of the Europeans' rules than the, than the United States' rules. So diplomatically, that's important. And two, uh, economically speaking, the, the challenge that's being presented to the United States when, when you're confronted with a product, uh, um, uh, if you are in the, um, the booming Indian middle class or the booming, uh, uh, beginning to boom Brazilian middle class uh, of a product that, uh, that has been undergone a toxic screen from the European Union versus a product that has not undergone a toxic screen from the United States, which are you going to choose? So economically speaking, I think this is going to be presenting real challenges to the United States as well. Have you seen if any of these laws passed by the European Union dealing with these toxic chemicals, if that's been challenged by bodies like the WTO, you know, that that's an unfair advantage you're giving to, you know, certain products, certain companies? Uh, yeah, good question. And, um, and, uh, and ultimately kind of fascinating because it gets to the core of the sort of whole globalized economy that we're in. Um, in most every case, what, I'm, what I've been talking about here, there's been the initial challenge to the Europeans' action by the United States in the World Trade Organization, a, essentially a, 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 a paper um, suggesting a challenge coming down the line submitted to something called the Technical Barriers to Trade Committee in the World Trade Organization. And in every case, those challenges have either not been submitted or have been withdrawn. And that's because the uh, Europeans know exactly, you know, 
there, there's, there's aware the WTO as we are aware of the WTO. And the WTO, uh, whatever your feelings about the WTO, it is there, and it's a very important factor in global trade, and there's no way around it, whatever you do, either in this country or uh, elsewhere in the world. So these laws have been written with the WTO in mind to create principles of non-discrimination. They don't discriminate against, um, they, they don't discriminate in favor of European producers over uh, uh, American or other foreign producers. Uh, they apply across the board. And they also uh, hang within a kind of an area within WTO law, allowing kind of some level of latitude when it comes to uh, health and safety considerations. And uh, so in every case, the laws have gone through the WTO screen and challenges that have been, that have been suggested that the United States would, would present and, and were in many ways used as a threat against the Europeans have never materialized. And I talked to the ambassador to the, U, to the European Union, American ambassador to the European Union, about this exact question. And he uh, conceded to me that actually it was appearing like the U.S. would have uh, uh, dwindling grounds for challenge of the WTO. So as yet, there's been no successful challenge to any of these measures at the WTO, which is what's uh, interesting when you think of the critiques of globalization that have occurred over the last uh, 10 uh, years or so, 10 or 15 years, many of which, if I recall, may have started right here in Seattle some, uh, some years ago, uh, uh, rising public unease with the way that the um, uh, globalization process was moving. And at that time, as well as ever since, the one, one of the great concerns of critics of globalization has been the drive, uh, driving of standards down. So driving of labor standards, of environmental protection standards, downwards, one of the big concerns as, as, as capital and production capability move overseas. Well, I think what's interesting, what I write about in, in, in my book, is this phenomenon to look at globalization a little differently. Nobody ever anticipated uh, during the designing of that system that a new economic player would emerge that we begin leveraging those standards up. And I think that's what's happening, at least in this area of uh, environmental health protection, that the EU is playing a completely uh, suggesting a new way that globalization can work, which is in this case, leveraging those standards upwards and then forcing the rest of the world's uh, markets to respond to those uh, dictates. And I think that's what's happening now. So it gives you a somewhat different way to look at globalization. So is it your sense then that the primary reason the U.S. corporations aren't implementing these changes within the U.S. is really a, a one of liability, that they will somehow have to bear responsibility for whatever potentially occurred before that change? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think a, 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 I think a concern, a, a, a not insignificant concern of um, American companies is the potential liability they're put under if they were to essentially concede the Europeans' um, uh, assertion that these substances are dangerous. Because then, if so, you open yourself up to, you know, real legal um, problems. I mean, we have a, uh, we have here a, a, um, a retributive justice system where we have very weak, essentially very weak regulations, but we do have a, a ability to bring court cases on product liability issues that is quite different from, from that in the European Union. They have similar things, but nowhere near the damages that we have here in, in, in the United States. So uh, when you look at that, industry often argues that that we don't need strong regulations because we have a lively tort system. We have a live, lively product liability system in America, and therefore we get punished if we, if we, if we uh, do something to abuse the trust of our consumers and we, and we, we end up harming consumers. Uh, so that's an important check on us. That's what industry uh, argues to me specifically and, to, and in general as well. But I talk to many people in... in uh, chemical toys uh, all down the line um, arguing this, this, this basic argument. And in fact, there's some truth to that because we do have a lively court system. We do have the ability to go to the courts to challenge uh, uh, 
uh, uh, company's uh, liability for product uh, safety problems. And uh, but there is a uh, uh, what what Europe number one presents is an interesting challenge. If you can prove in a court of law in the United States that uh, that that a product could have been produced more safely, right? It's a key question in a legal uh, setting. Uh, then that's part of what a plaintiff's lawyer wants. The plaintiff's lawyer in a product liability case needs to prove that the product could have been produced more safely. But for whatever reason, company X decided not to produce it that way. Now, suddenly you've got a situation where across the water, many of these products are being produced more safely. And, uh, and the evidence is beginning there, sometimes by the subsidiaries of the very same companies that may be being sued. So I think this kind of phenomenon of what's happening in the European Union is causing a great deal of un unease among American companies. One, at many, many different levels. Uh, but one certainly is the, is the potential for product liability that is opened up by the idea that products can be produced more safely than they are here in the United States. And, uh, and um, there's also considerable unease over the there's also considerable unease over the very notion that a, that a new foreign power, which many people had not been paying much attention to, uh, uh, um, suddenly was writing rules that major, major American interests have to abide by. I think there's enormous anxiety, and I actually interviewed a number of uh, top officials, both in the, in, in, the, in the industry as well as some former Commerce Department officials and such, and they talked palpably about this, um, this great unease sort of coursing through uh, American industry over the fact that this new force, the European Union, is beginning to write a lot of new rules. You had that here in, uh, here in Seattle. Your own uh, Microsoft, of course, came up right, right against this on the question of competition. And they, they, of course, had to admit that they were engaged in monopolistic uh, behavior in uh, the European Union. And, uh, and uh, of course, I'm sure got a lot of attention around here. Well, those, some of those same, that's the same teeth that are behind those kind of principles are being applied to environmental issues uh, now. And many American companies are coming to a jolt to realize um, how significant these changes are. Um, you've got a system in America that was largely written under the influence of American company uh, lobbying. I mean, it's not an overstatement to say that, I mean, nor am I being paranoid or anything. It's just the way it is. You look at the data, that, that's just the way it is. And, uh, and the um, American companies have become accustomed to the, the, the relative laissez-faire of the EPA. And, uh, and certainly the cosmetic companies have become accustomed to the relative laissez-faire of the FDA. And it's, it's, it, these are rules that they helped to write over years and years and years of back and forth with the government. Now suddenly a uh, governing force over which they have very little control. I mean, they, they've tried to actually exert uh, influence uh, um, to very, very limited effect, uh, uh, is writing rules that they have to deal with. There's enormous kind of unease happening in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, um, in American business. I used to go down when I was writing the book down to Silicon Valley, which is, of course, the other center of, uh, of uh, the other center of... Um, High tech. Yeah, I, I used to go, while I was reporting the, uh, the book, I used to go down to these sessions down in Silicon Valley, the other center of high tech uh, here in America. And, uh, and I'd sit in on these seminars as all these engineers got together, uh, were, were, were convened, uh, 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 50, 60, 100 engineers in a room uh, convened to listen to uh, consultants who were, who were there to tell them about the new rule changes coming in from the European Union, which demands, of course, the removal of lead and cadmium and mercury and chromium from, uh, from uh, electronic devices. And the uh, palpable anxiety in uh, those rooms, you could, you, could, you could scrape it off the walls. I mean, suddenly these engineers who themselves have created many of these items that we all use, the, the iPods and, and all the nifty devices, um, were confronted with a, another governing force 
telling them what was permitted to be used in those items. In this case, the chemical issue is not so much exposure over the course of a lifetime of an electronic device, because they're pretty well contained in those electronic devices, but the concern is the entering into the waste stream, essentially. Once they decompose 10, 15, 20 years later, where, does it, where do all those small, minute amounts of chemicals and heavy met toxic metals go where they all accumulate? You know, we're talking tens and tens of millions of these electronic devices accumulate and, 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 and make their way into the water and the air and uh, the soil and et cetera. So a whole array of initiatives in the electronics industry to remove those kind of substances as well. So the anxiety over that question was really, truly uh, palpable. And, uh, and I write in the book about essentially how the U.S. high-tech industry has been slowly, grindingly kind of beginning to adapt to some of these rules coming down from, uh, from Europe. So would that example parallel what was happening in other industries as well when the European Union instituted these changes and said you can no longer have these toxins in your products uh, coming into our country. Did you get a sense for that the different industries already knew that those toxins were in their products and knew which ones were in which products, or that it was more that they went, uh-oh, now we have to go back and test and find out which ones they're in and make changes? That is a good question. I think I think both. I think both. I think I think I think. Let's face it. Engineers. I mean, I came up with a huge amount of regard for uh, engineers who actually design these materials because I didn't really understand much about the production process until I really got into reporting uh, this book. And I came to really appreciate the ingenuity of these guys, people who are working on these minute levels with all these extraordinary connections. And, and they say I'm banging away on my computer thinking, oh, yeah, the five billionth word I've put into my machine here is somehow being uh, remembered and, and processed. I mean, I came up with, with, a, with a, a, a great deal of respect for that creative process. And, um, and I think the, but the one thing that is not considered often or hasn't been traditionally considered in the process of making those things is all these neat uh, connections have to happen. And the key question for a designer is, really, let's make that connection happen. I want to make this machine do this, and, uh, and let's find what it needs to, to, to make that work. Well, what, now we've reached an, almost another level when it comes to, the, uh, to, to, to electronics, we're reaching very high levels of sophistication and everything, is what are the potential collateral damages of those particular materials, those particular linking mechanisms and transmitting uh, materials uh, down the line, 10, 15, 20 years down the line as these things decay in, 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 into the environment. And so what I think is... Um, is now being demanded of the industry is a level of attentiveness to those questions that has not been there before. So on the one hand, yes, I think people knew, of course, that they're working, if you're working with lead, mercury, you know what you're dealing with, but you're not really impelled to think through the long-term consequences of what working with that kind of material is. So by creating a new law, a new, uh, 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 a new ground from which to move, uh, the Europeans have compelled uh, designers uh, to think, well, man, is there, a, is there another kind of thing I could be using instead of lead to, to, to make this transmission work? And I don't know yet if it's going to work, but maybe I'm going to check it out because I can't use lead anymore. Let's figure it out. And in fact, um, I've talked to people in the, in the high-tech uh, um, world, and really those who have been following the EU's laws and working with American companies in trying to get them to uh, realize the rules coming down the pike. And uh, they told me that what was interesting was that many of the changes demanded by the EU were about um, 80 to 85 percent of them were actually pretty easy. And, and, and I have to say, I don't know what easy means. If you're a designer, I can't do whatever it is they do. But this is somebody who himself is a, is a designer and working in these areas. He said about 80 to 85 percent were relatively easy. You're finding the alternatives, finding other ways to do things. You just had to begin thinking differently. He said probably 10 to 20 percent were actually going to be more difficult in terms of finding uh, the real alternatives. Uh, but if you start at 80 percent, that's not a bad percent in terms of dealing with the kind of uh, mechanisms out there. And I think that that only happens when a law creates the demand, because um, if you're accustomed to working with uh, lead and mercury and cadmium and it works, it seems to do the job, um, we all benefit from those connections that are made. Um, 
uh, you're not prompted to be f- to to actually think otherwise that maybe there's something else that could also do it. And I think one of the effects of a law, and it gets into this interplay perhaps between regulation and innovation, which is a constant sort of debate, you could say, uh, has prompted uh, uh, international manufacturers to think of new ways of designing these items to be less uh, environmentally, uh, uh, have a less uh, environmentally malevolent effect on the on the on, on our surroundings, on our health, and the and our surroundings. Um, so I think that gets to your question whether the electronics industry knew or not. I, I think and, and, uh, uh, I think clearly they they knew what they was they're working with. Whether chemists exactly understand the long term implications uh, environmentally of what they're working with, you know, they're, they 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 haven't been prompted to think like that, and. Uh, and now they are. And the results are kind of interesting because many of these changes are being made right now in the, in the, in the electronics industry, which is really the most multinational industry there is, really, in terms of the, the massiveness of the international reach uh, from here in Washington, from California, from other high-tech centers of the world. I mean, it's a truly global world that is adapting, that is being impelled to sort of adapt new modes of manufacturing in response to laws coming down, not from Washington, but from Brussels. And these other, these parallel lines, these other uh, production facilities that they're using, are they making equivalent profits for the companies? Oh, yeah. 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 They're, I mean, we're talking major companies, Panasonic, Sony, all the way down the line. So the fact is that um, they have to because, um, well, number one, their profit margin has not been affected. Two, the number of countries that are adopting these laws are growing far beyond Europe. I mean, what we don't in the United States don't understand is we are the isolated ones. We're the ones who are being surrounded by, uh, by countries which are adopting the Europeans' provisions. So just to go through a quick list... I mean, Korea, Japan already, of course, but Korea, Japan, Taiwan, um, Australia, Mexico, uh, even some of the countries in Latin America, all are beginning to adapt these basic provisions of, uh, of the, of the um, electronics laws from the European Union, including China. China has a law which basically starting uh, next year will ban the very same six substances banned from electronics by the Europeans will be banned in China. And guess what? They have an exemption to their law. And that law, uh, uh, that exemption is essentially of exporters. So basically starting next year, the Chinese are going to have uh, a law based roughly on that of the European Union banning the same six substances from electronics for consumption by Chinese citizens. But the exemption is for exporters. So when it comes to, uh, for example, all the no-name brands, uh, we're not talking about the big transnational companies right now. We're talking about the no-name brands that are about uh, 20% of the market right now for electronics. All those no-name brands that are at the discount stores, and you can buy them online, and, and, and the, 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 uh, the DVD players and the... Um, Answering machines and the cell phones, those without brand names, about 20% of the market, the electronics industry uh, calculates, they will be under no compulsion to produce uh, electronics uh, without these chemicals. So where are they going to go? What's the major remaining market for electronics with those toxic chemicals in them? The United States. The United States, we are going to be that market, which the... Uh, which the um, Electronics industry itself estimates it's about 20% of the American market are all these kind of no-name brands that don't care about exporting to the European Union. And so they've got a plenty big market here in the United States as well as in Chad and Mali and, uh, and uh, Paraguay and um, other countries that have uh, even weaker regulations. And that's not an aspersion on either Chad, Mali, or Paraguay. That is just to say that basically the United States, from a market point of view, if you're, a, if you're a, uh, an offshore producer and you're looking at where your markets are and you're deciding, all right, well, the Europeans, as well as the Koreans and the Mexicans and the Taiwanese 
are putting, and the Chinese, are putting restrictions on what I can put in these products. Well, if I want to hold on to the way I've been doing things for years, and I want to hold on to at least a portion of a market, I can export the United States as well as these other countries that, are, that have, you could even say, have lower productive standards in the United States. All right. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you. We have just been talking with Mark Shapiro. He is author of the book Exposed, The Toxic Chemistry of Everyday Products and What's at Stake for American Power.